when we talk about things in science that we know, we then need to talk about how did we learn that, or how did we come to know that. And so if I were to tell you that the average weight of a human baby at birth was 7 pounds and 4 ounces, perhaps you would believe me. Perhaps partly because it sounds reasonable. Perhaps because you've seen babies that were born at roughly that size. And for a number of other reasons, you might believe me. But the question really would be, where did that number come from? And then does that then validate that number or not? So the scientific method is the method by which we learn things and by which we can then say this is the case. And the first part of the scientific method really is an observation. So you might have observed that babies are born at different sizes. Not all babies are born exactly the same size. So that would be your observation. And that observation then leads to a question. And your question in this case might be, what is the average birth weight of human babies? And this is sort of a complicated question because there are so many different factors that can influence the outcome in terms of the baby's weight. So it really would be quite complicated to do this sort of analysis, but we'll stick with it. So you have the question, and then you would develop a hypothesis. And a hypothesis basically is a guess of what you think the answer is. So you have to have a guess that you can then test. So you form a hypothesis. And the particular example of this flowchart here, let's just go with this one, is the idea that you have a couple of different antibiotics and you want to see which one is most effective at treating ulcers. So the proposal or the hypothesis here is that antibiotic B is better for treating ulcers than antibiotic A. So that's your guess. What you then need to do is you need to test it. And that test is going to be in the form of experiments. And in this case you would have three different groups or three different test uh, subjects to work with and you're going to always have a control and that is a group that you didn't do anything to that's your starting point to compare and see if any of the things you did actually made a difference compared to doing nothing sometimes the control is going to receive nothing sometimes it will receive a placebo which is in this case a pill that looks just like the other pills but it just in this case would contain something like sugar and so it would have no medical impact on that person whatsoever. Test group one might contain an antibiotic A and then test two might receive antibiotic B. So we've got the two different antibiotics that are being compared to each other and we've also got this sugar pill. You would then give that to these different people with uh, ulcers and see what happens to them and then you would collect that data and so in this case what they would found is that after analyzing that data 10 percent of the people with ulcers who were given the placebo got better so 10 percent of people's ulcers in other words were self-curing test group one that received antibiotic a which was the one we thought wouldn't be as good uh, cured 60 percent of the people who received it of their stomach ulcers and then test group two that got antibiotic B the one we thought was going to be the better one actually had an 80 percent cure rate so we could then say yes uh, antibiotic B is better than antibiotic A but a certain percentage were cured even with nothing so that's an interesting observation in and of itself now if the test results had been that uh, antibiotic A in test group 1 uh, had a 60% cure rate and antibiotic B in test group 2 had a 62% cure rate we would then say that's not different enough uh, B wasn't better enough from A to say it is truly better that could have just been coincidence or it's not a big enough difference to be significant in this case though a 20% difference in cure rate is going to be considered a significant difference so we would then be able to actually say Antibiotic B is better than antibiotic A. That was a pretty simple outcome, and no matter what we thought, we got the right answer. We found out which one actually worked better. If we'd been doing something a little more complicated, let's say trying to find a cure for cancer, you would go through this process of placebos, test groups of various things you're testing, but your end result might be everyone dies. 
So in that case, that didn't prove which one was better. It simply said none of these really worked. And in that case, you would have to reject your hypothesis that said, I think this particular treatment will work. You found out, no, it doesn't. So you trash the whole thing, and then you start over from scratch with a new test group, a new medicine to try. And you would perhaps have to keep doing that for many, many times before you actually got something that maybe worked. And in the case of cancer drugs, sometimes you just never find a cure. So some hypotheses might need to be rejected and start the process over, and others, as we saw here with this antibiotic test, we got an answer, and it happened to support our hypothesis. If our hypothesis had been wrong, and A was actually better than B, instead of B being better than A, we would have said our hypothesis was wrong, but we would not have needed to start over from scratch because we had the answer we were looking for. We had the actual best treatment there. But again, with things that don't have any sort of success at all, we might have to scratch our original idea and start from scratch. That can be quite frustrating. So some problems are simple to approach this way, and some require a lot of additional input. In the case of the idea of who or what would be the average weight of a human baby at birth, we would also need to factor in geographical area. We need to factor in socioeconomic status, health of the mother, age of the mother, physical body size of the mother. Is this the first, second, or third child the mother has had? Did mama smoke? Did mama consume alcohol? Uh, did mama receive proper prenatal care? Lots and lots of other things would go into that mix in that uh, analysis. And so that would get very, very complicated very quickly. Here we need to talk about Koch's postulates. Koch's postulates are a set of criteria that we can utilize to then determine does this particular pathogen or does this particular thing actually the cause of the problem? Or is it just there by random chance? So this is Dr. Fred Marshall. And his idea in the early 80s was that stomach ulcers, he felt, were caused by this little bacteria we see here, Helicobacter pylori. And so he thought that was the case. But at that time, current medical wisdom said that ulcers were caused by something you ate or the stress that you were experiencing or some other lifestyle factor. And so they would then suggest people de-stress, avoid eating acidic foods and things like that. But Dr. Marshall thought that, no, I think it's really these bacteria that are causing the problem. And it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with what you're eating or how stressed you are or anything else. But to prove that, you have to satisfy Koch's postulates. And the postulate number one is that you must find that thing present in every case of the disease or the problem. That's pretty simple. For the case of ulcers, everyone who expresses an ulcer, they could go in and do a stomach swab and look to see if the bacteria was there. So that's pretty simple. And so in that case, he checked off postulate number one very quickly. Postulate number two says you have to take that thing you found and you have to be able to grow it in the lab. That's typically something that's fairly easily done as well. In the case of most bacteria, it's not hard at all. So the first two postulates typically aren't difficult to check off those boxes, but postulate three is where you run into some challenges. Postulate three says you have to take what you grew in the lab, introduce it into an otherwise healthy person who doesn't have the problem you're considering, and it must cause that disease or that problem in every person you introduce it to. So to check off this box, Dr. Marshall would have to find a number of people who didn't have stomach ulcers, convince them to swallow a test tube full of these bacteria, and wait to see if it chewed holes in their stomach. Now obviously this isn't something that the average person is going to enthusiastically sign up for, so he had some problems finding volunteers. But he was so convinced that he was right, and he had to satisfy postulate three before anyone would take him seriously, he and some volunteers, I don't know if they volunteered or were voluntold, but they swallowed this potion. And sure enough, a short period of time later, they developed stomach ulcers. So postulate three was satisfied. They consumed the lab-grown product, and it did cause the problem. Postulate four is then that you must find, still present at the source of the disease or problem, what you introduced to cause the disease. And all four of these postulates are really designed to eliminate coincidence, to eliminate random chance. 
So we're saying it's not there because the disease is present. It's not there just by random chance. It's not there because the body's now weak. It's there because it caused the problem. And satisfying those four postulates, for the most part, is going to eliminate those random chances or those coincidences or those things that didn't really have anything to do with it but just happened to be going on at the same time. Now this is something that, again, for some things is easy to do and other things where it causes serious problems, it's hard to find volunteers to satisfy postulates three and four. What we're seeing these days in healthcare with the current situation with the coronavirus going on is that Koch's postulates have been thrown out the window. They're all the time coming out with new symptoms and new things about kids get swollen toes and, and all kinds of other really stupid things. And they're saying that this is caused by corona. But what they're doing is they're ignoring the fact that they haven't gone through Koch's postulates yet to verify that is the cause. So those symptoms could be there by random chance. They could be there because you have the problem but not necessarily caused by the problem or it may have nothing to do with anything, and these days everything is getting labeled as coronavirus. Uh, I just heard the other day that some hospitals are telling their staff to diagnose everything, every symptom, everything they treat, every death included, as coronavirus. Because apparently they get to bill the government more money for coronavirus-related treatments and problems than they do for something that's not caused by corona. So in that case, everything is getting labeled as corona. Everything is getting reported as positive corona cases and weird symptoms and an exaggerated number of deaths from corona. And they're doing all that ignoring the basic premise of Koch's postulates. And that is until you can find it in every case. So if these swollen, twisted toes are really caused by corona, everyone who has corona should have swollen, twisted toes. They should be able to find these things in every case, not just in a few random cases. So what that means is these random cases are probably some other strange thing going on, but that person is actually getting medical attention, perhaps because they have tested positive for corona. Um, and so it's really exaggerating the numbers and making it probably sound a lot worse than it really is because there's this chase for money, because they're ignoring the basic premises of Koch's postulates, especially because it's not convenient to the narrative right now. And, and sometimes it is complicated to satisfy those postulates. But without doing that, we really can't make definitive statements like are being made. So unfortunately, it's a very complicated state of affairs in which our basic guiding principles have been ignored. And hopefully someday, probably in another couple of years, uh, those things will be applied to this situation. And some of these numbers will probably change quite dramatically. I know with swine flu, the numbers changed quite dramatically after the initial drama was over with. Then the numbers were actually sorted out, and it was determined that not everything was really swine flu at that point. So I think the same thing will probably happen with uh, corona here as these postulates finally get applied to the situation. And they'll back up and change a lot of these statements that have been made when they say, well, you know, we really can't prove that. We really can't support that, and what we've said really wasn't accurate. So just remember that you can't jump to conclusions on these sorts of things. You have to go through the procedures of either the scientific method or Koch's postulates, and they're all designed to make sure that you don't have coincidental findings. You have actually what's going on, and you've eliminated coincidence. You've eliminated random chance, and then you can be more comfortable with your answers. So just remember those things, and... Um, Hopefully that will be a little bit more useful for you in life. Hopefully this all made sense and was helpful and you learned a lot from it. Thanks. We'll see you next time.